Four things that I'm going to cover here this morning, most of the time when we've been going through the, the series now on the teachings of Jesus, that we've been kind of doing them two by two. Well, this, this week when Gary and I were having breakfast, and he said, oh, by the way, we've had a change in speaker schedule this week. The person who we thought was going to be here is not going to be able to make it. Do you want to do the sermon? You can do anything you want. I thought, well, I'm going to take four. <laughs> Actually, at the time, I thought, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I've got this list that, I, that I've been working off of, but I'm going to take a little liberty, which happens to be one of the things that I'm going to talk about. The other three are be powerful, love one another, and hear God's voice. I'm going to start out with be powerful. And I want to tell you a story back from, I think it was 2006, spring of 2006, if I remember correctly. Graham Cook came to the Quad Cities, and he delivered a message at a prayer event that David Pouch had put together. And Graham, Cook's, Graham Cook described it as he was calling the church back to Christ. He, was, he, he came in to the Quad Cities, and in the first, the first couple of hours of the meetings that morning, he really talked about believing prayer and, and what he was invited there. And then at the end, before we broke for lunch, he said, okay, now that I've covered what I was asked to talk about, let's go to lunch, and when we get back, I'll talk about what I'm really here for. And when Graham Cook says that, that really gets your eyebrows to go up. Wonder what is coming. And his message, when he, when he got back that afternoon, he, as I described it, he threw down the gauntlet to the Church of the Quad Cities. And he said, basically, be the church. Be the church because the world is depending upon you. Amen. Be the church in what Christ has always said you are going to be. Be the church in power. Be the church in authority be the church that we were intended to be and stop waiting stop waiting for somebody else to come in and and make this happen stop waiting for god to do some kind of miraculous move because simply he's waiting on you he's given you what you need and the one that really rang my bell was when he said, your waiting on God is turning into disobedience. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 through 8, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Now those of you who have been around the sanctuary for a while, probably you're wondering at this point in time, does Scott ever give a sermon where he does not talk about this verse? <laughs> I'm starting to wonder that as well. And in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 through 18, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up servants. They will, ser blah, 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 blah. they will take up serpents. We're not going to do that. Nobody do that voluntarily. That's not really a good idea. And if they drink anything deadly, don't recommend doing that either. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You know, I love when we get the opportunity to pray for people in the service. And we're going to get more opportunities to do, for that, do that later. And I love to see the way the Holy Spirit moves and heals people. Amen. That is what we're here for. We are here to help heal the sick. We are here to engage with God in the work that he is doing in this world and see people's lives get touched. We are here to be the fulfillment of what Christ started 2,000 years ago. Now, I will also say this, and 
I don't think that we really have this issue, but I've, I've seen this kind of out, of out of some churches and out of, out of some believers. But when you see somebody get healed by God supernaturally intervening, and like in the, what we've seen here earlier today, you see you know, pain, 50% of it go, or whether that woman goes into physical therapy and sees that relieved, or whether she goes into surgery and the skill of the surgeon is able to heal her. God rejoices. He loves it either way. God put all of these different skills here on earth for a purpose. And whether it is a miraculous intervention or whether it is, is from you know, the, the visit to the doctor, we should rejoice either way. But what we can do, since those of us here, as far as I know, unless there's some visitors here that have done this, have not spent 12 years in medical training learning how to use a scalpel, learning how to diagnose illness. But we can engage with the Holy Spirit. We can engage with Him. And we can see healing. Amen. So what we're going to do, this is going to be the first of four declarations that we're going to do in this message. So I want you all to repeat after me. I declare... Great start. <laughs> that I am a supernatural person. I agree with God and call heaven to come to earth through me. I will heal the sick. I will cleanse the leper. I will raise the dead. I will cast out demons. I will cast out demons. Jesus, I accept, Jesus, I accept. The, invitation the invitation to be your partner. So be it. So be it. Amen. 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 <laughs> Too slow? <laughs> Love. Love. Okay, you don't have to follow me. You don't have to repeat that at this point. Wait, wait, wait a little bit longer and we'll get back to that. <laughs> Love one another. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14 are probably two of the most common chapters in the Bible when we talk about spiritual gifts. They're the, probably the two most common chapters in the Bible when, when we refer to how does God move through his people. It is no coincidence that those two chapters sandwich 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 13 is probably the most quoted chapter at every wedding in a Christian church around the world. It's the love chapter. Why? Why is this chapter sandwiched in between these two other chapters where he's talking about spiritual gifts. Well, the reason being is that if you get caught up in these gifts and this supernatural power, you can really kind of start thinking, hey, I'm hot stuff. You need to come see me. Because I've got it. And oh, by the way, you know, if uh, I've got it, you know, the implication is, is that, well, you don't. <laughs> On that. The reason that 13 is there is the reminder everything, everything that the Holy Spirit does is because of love. Everything that you and I do should be buried in love. Yes. This is not greater than that. 
The gift of administration is not greater than the gift of tongues. The gift of wisdom is not greater than faith. The person who heals by the supernatural touch of the spirit is not greater than the surgeon who, whose skill saves as well. We must love, we must love Christians, we must love our neighbors, we must love our leaders, we must love our enemies. It's kind of like everybody. Now I'll admit, being the political animal that I am, sometimes it's really difficult for me to remember that. Some of you who follow my Facebook page probably think it's a little more difficult than more times than others. My wife tries to keep me honest on that, so. But that's our mandate. That is our charge. Love, 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 love. You know, like the song, L is for the way you look at me. O is for the only one I see. V is very, very extraordinary. E is even more than anyone that you adore and love is all that I can give to you. And we'll finish there. So let's make a declaration about love. So repeat after me. This is where you can do it again. I declare that I am a person of love. I am patient. I am kind. I do not envy what others have. I do not brag. I am not proud. I honor, I honor others. I am not self-seeking. I, self I am not easily angered. I do not keep a record of wrongs of others, nor myself. I do not delight when bad things happen to others, but I rejoice when good things happen to them. I always protect. I always trust. I always hope. And I always persevere. So be it. Amen. Be free. In John chapter 8, verses 31 32, through 32 and then 36, Jesus says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Not free to sin, not free to go do whatever happens to feel good at the time, but free to fulfill what God's call on your life is. Amen. You often hear that people are too quick to put God in a box. Well, I would tell you, people are even quicker to put themselves in a box. A box of their own design. And certainly not a box of God's design. Because his box hasn't got any walls. Gary, a couple of weeks ago, I think you had mentioned something about the Hubble Space Telescope and how they had put, was it, was it you, that you, had you 
use this illustration or, was it, or is it somebody else that I'm thinking of? Oh, no, wait, no, that was down in Kansas City. Still very appropriate. I wish I would have. Yeah. Here, you know, the, the Hubble Space Telescope is, is the most accurate optical telescope that man has ever in, invented. They stuck it out in outer space, so it's beyond all of the atmospheric interference that we have here on Earth. And, you know, they, they, they've been using this for almost 15 years now and have seen amazing, amazing, incredible things. Well, they decided at one point that they were going to take this, this telescope and they were going to focus it on this stretch of, of space, this sector of space, where they couldn't, where there was just nothing there. You know, they, they, they look at it and there's nothing that's just blank, black, nothing there. And what they did is they, they shrunk the aperture of the telescope down to one millimeter. And then they back that off one meter from the sensors. So you're talking about a pinhole that it's looking through into this spot in space where nobody has ever seen anything. And then they exposed it, I think they said, for 11 days. Do you know what they found there? Over 10,000 galaxies. Not stars, galaxies full of billions and billions of stars. Do you want to know how big God's box is for you? That ain't nothing. God has designed you to be free. God has designed you with liberty in your DNA. God has designed you with unlimited potential. Unfortunately, through things we've done, through things others have done to us, there are things in our lives which are keeping a cap on that liberty, keeping a cap on that freedom. And I would encourage you, find out what those are and get rid of them. Ask God, Lord, what is holding me down? What is that cap that has been screwed down on me? He'll find ways to tell you. Which we'll get to in just the next section here. So let's make a freedom declaration. So repeat after me. I declare, I declare that, I that I am free. I am free in God. I am free, in God. I am free to pursue who He has made me to be. I am free to receive. All that God has in store for me. I am free to follow my dreams. I expect to see those dreams fulfilled. I am free from the shackles of the devil. I am free from bondage. I am free of I can't. I am free of yeah, but. I am free of yeah, but. I am free. I am free. Amen. Amen. So be it. So be it. <laughs> Hear God's voice. You know, when we look at the original model in the Garden of Eden, Talks about Adam walking in the cool of the day with the Father. Actually, I kind of think that that was probably Jesus that he was walking with. But walking in the cool of the day with God and, and talking with him, carrying on a conversation with him. I always kind of wonder, so what, would, what did they talk about? What, what do you think I 
I should call that tree? I don't know. What do you like about it? Well, uh, it's kind of you know, like that fruit up there. Well, what do you call the fruit? Oh, I call it an apple. Okay, call it an apple tree. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. That's a good idea. <laughs> that was the original design. Man was meant to talk with God. Amen. Man was meant to commune with him. But weird things happened. You could go back and talk about, okay, yeah, Adam and Eve screwed up. And that led to just this constant degrading of that communication between God. But you can still see all throughout the Old Testament stories of how God would encounter people. But De Deuteronomy 5 really kind of paints a picture of what the problem was. Starting in Deuteronomy 5.23, So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, this is Israel at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses has brought them out of Egypt. They are at the base of Mount Sinai. They've set up the, they're, they're getting ready to set up all of the, the order of worship, the tabernacle, and all those pieces. So it was when you heard the voice in the midst of the dark, darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, that you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God speaks with man, yet he still lives. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? You go near. Israel is talking to Moses. You do it. You go and hear all that the Lord our God may say and then come back and tell us that the Lord our God says to you and we will hear and do it. God so much wanted to have that communication with his people. And they freaked out. We can't handle this. We don't know what to do. We're afraid that we're going to die. Moses had already kind of proven that ain't going to happen unless you do really stupid things. But they looked at the experiences of all those rebelled against God and said, well, that's going to happen to us as well if we get too close to God. They really kind of took the example and made up a pretty messed up doctrine out of it. How many other times have we done that? Jesus says in Matthew eleven fifteen, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He, God is pleading, listen, I'm talking to you. Yes. In Luke 10, Jesus talks about how the sheep know his voice. The devil has convinced the world and most of the church that if you say that you talk with God and God talks back to you, that you're nuts. <laughs> that couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. In fact, that is, in my opinion, that the most damning lie that, that anybody has been convinced of. I think the absolute most important thing that the church can do is to teach the world how to hear the voice of God. Because if you can hear the voice of God for yourself, everything else, everything in your life changes. You know, I remember the first time when I figured out God was talking to me. I was in college, and I was watching a, a program where James Robeson was speaking. Who here has ever heard of James Robeson? A few of you. Okay, good. One of my favorite speakers. 
And as I was listening to him preach, he makes the point, said, do you know one of the reasons why we are supposed to read the Bible? It is so we'll know what the voice of God sounds like. So when you have that thought that comes into your mind and you think, hmm, that sounds like something out of the Bible. That's God speaking to you. And it was at that point that all of these previous experiences that I had had popped into my mind and I thought, oh my gosh, God has been trying to speak to me all this, God's been speaking to me all this time. The next thought that immediately followed it was, no kidding. I have been trying to get that through to you for years. And as soon as I had that revelation, it was like, bang! All the channels of communication were open. Ways he has spoken to me since, those thoughts that have come to your head, People talk about as far as you know the, the your inner voice. I have my own inner voice, and then as well there is this other inner voice that pops up, which I have learned to recognize. Ah, that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. I always think it's interesting. One of the stories that that, that I found most fascinating about this was uh, uh, Charlton Heston talked about when he was filming the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille came to him and said, okay, when we get to the scene where, it's, where you're up on the mountain and such, I'm going to be, I'm going to be speaking, and, and that'll be the narration as far as God's voice. And Charlton Heston stops him and goes, sorry, sorry, CB, uh, but that's not going to work. And CB, Cecil B. DeMille just going, well, why is that? He goes, if you want this to be real, then I need to hear the way God speaks to me. And the way God speaks to me is in my own, is often in my own voice. But he knew the difference. God is not going to, most often you're not going to have an experience with God where it's this booming voice. Mark, this is God. Take out the trash, Mark. <laughs> Mark, that's not God, that's your dad standing behind you playing with you. <laughs> but we have to realize that God, when, when we're learning what, this, what the voice of the Holy Spirit sounds like, sometimes it starts out very subtle. But you need to engage with that because it's like a child learning how to talk. And you need to stand on the verse out of James where it says, if you lack wisdom, ask, and the Holy Spirit is sure to give it to you, but do not be double-minded. Double-minded means second-guessing yourself. Well, maybe that was, maybe that wasn't. If you know scripture, and you know what God expects, and you know what's right, and you know what's wrong, it's pretty easy to figure out what the voice of God sounds like. Other ways he speaks to me, pictures. Particularly when, when we're praying for folks, pictures will pop into my, will pop into my head. God will use those to, to help explain, here's what we need to, need to address. Visions, dreams, feelings. I had one episode when we were, Susan and I were down in South America and we were ministering down there. This is, is one of the more unusual ways that he speaks to me. I know that there are others here in, in, in the meeting that God speaks to you like this a lot. Not to me, not very often. In fact, this is the one instance, two, second, one or two instances I can remember this happening. Walked into the meeting and immediately felt depression, anxiety. You know, uh, uh, thoughts of, of, of suicide, you know, you, you just, every problem you could imagine just wham, hits me as soon as I walk across the door. 
I'm like, oh gosh, I know what this is. This is what everybody in here is dealing with. And the Holy Spirit makes it very clear, said, okay, guess what? You're gonna be the one interceding on all these things during the meeting. And I, I for like for the first five, 10 minutes, I'm arguing with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work out well. And I go back and forth with the Lord, this is not what I do. This isn't, this isn't me, this isn't the way I work, come on. This is the way Susan works. Susan does this kind of stuff. Or, 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 or you know, John, or you know, I, I could add five or six people on the team that I could point to and say, they're a lot more, do a lot of this stuff a lot more than I do. I know. Drew your number today, this is what you get to do. <laughs> so there's all kinds of ways that the Holy Spirit talks to you. Last way that, uh, give you a good example of how he talked to me. And this, I would have to say, was one of the biggest tests that I'd ever had in, in working with the Holy Spirit and the way he communicates to me. 2007. Actually, it would have been uh, 2006. And at that point in time, I was single. And talking with the Holy Spirit and saying, you know, Holy Spirit, I'm kind of tired of being single. Sorry, 1996. <laughs> 96. I'm tired of being single, you know, and, and he says, well, gee, have you ever thought about praying about it? I thought, who? That's probably a good idea. And so I, I, I don't even remember what the three things were, but I, I put together this, okay, you know, I got these three things that I want to pray. And I went back to the Holy Spirit and I said, hey, uh, can I pray these three things? And uh, you say, okay, that sounds good. Pray those three things. Every time you think about that you're, that you're lonely or that you wish you could uh, meet your wife or, or any of those things, just quickly pray those three things. So I've been praying those three things for probably a week or two. And I was at this meeting, and it was a, a meeting at the vineyard, actually just about uh, eight blocks down the street here. We were having a 24-hour prayer watch. And I'm sitting up there, and something comes to my mind. I was taking notes, and so I just prayed quickly through those three things, and the Holy Spirit tells me I've already brought her. And I hung. So yeah, I've already brought her. And at that point in time, the only single woman that I knew that I had any kind of relationship whatsoever was not anyone that I would ever consider. I go, oh, no, oh, no, 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 and he says, look up. And I look up, Susan is standing at the podium, teaching. And the Holy Spirit tells me, it's her. And immediately, these big red flags, flashing red, red lights, sirens go off in my head. Woo! Warning, warning, warning. I was like, no, 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 no. I am not getting caught by this trick. I don't know how many women I have advised. If anybody ever comes up to you and tells you, God says, I'm supposed to marry you. Run. I know this does, no, oh, God doesn't work this way. Uh-uh, no, 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 no. I can just imagine the Holy Spirit's just like, <coughs> Oh, we got him on this one. This is going to be fun. <laughs> you think God laughs about the way we do? Oh, man, you better believe he does. I am certain we are his biggest source of entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. So this went on for like a month. And every time I prayed, I already brought her. I already brought her. I already brought her. Finally gets around to February. This has been going on for over a month. 
thought, okay, you know, I, I was, I was kind of trying to get to know a lot of the different leaders in the church as well, taking them out for lunch, that sort of stuff. So I thought, I'm going to at least ask this woman to go to lunch with me. The rest is history. <laughs> if you want the other juicy details, you can let Susan fill you. God speaks. God wants to talk to us. God is desperate to carry on a conversation with us. And if you want to know how to really grow in the Holy Spirit, and if you want to know what your calling in life is, and you want to fulfill that call that God has on your life, learn what the voice of God sounds like. Now, I'll remind those of you here that I had mentioned something to earlier and then those that I didn't get a chance to, for those of you in leadership, you know who you are. If the Holy Spirit has any words of knowledge or anything for you this morning, keep your ear tuned. Because once we get done with this, I'm going to ask to see what the, if the Holy Spirit has anything specific that he wants to do. But first, we're going to do a hearing declaration. So repeat after me. I am a child of God. And I know my Father's voice. I hear God's voice. I hear him when he speaks. To me in my thoughts. I hear him when he speaks. To me in my dreams. I hear him when he speaks to me through reading the Bible. I hear him when he speaks to me in pictures. I hear him when he speaks to me through songs. And I hear him when he speaks to me through other people. I hear God when he speaks to me in a thousand different ways. So be it. Amen. So let me tell you about one dream that I've had recently. Actually, it wasn't terribly so recently. It was uh, back last summer. And I awoke from a dream. It was as vivid as any of those that, that I think the Holy Spirit has ever given me. And Susan and I were in a Cessna 172. For those of you who are not familiar with small airplanes, it is a very common four-seat airplane. God often speaks to me in, in these kinds of illustrations. I'm a pilot. And in this dream, Susan and I are in the front seats. I'm flying. And there are two people in the back seat. I didn't recognize them. They, they're kind of like these faceless sort of images, so you don't really know what they're doing there. Who knows, they could have been angels, don't know. But as we're flying along, it was a really nice airplane. One of the newer ones with you know, the glass cockpits and the LCD screens and all that sort of fun stuff. But as we're flying this along, I thought, well, yeah, this is kind of a nice airplane, but it doesn't really fit. And at that point, the flight instructor pops his head up between the two of us, looking at me, and this is another common theme in, in a lot of dreams that the Holy Spirit often gives me. When the flight instructor pops up, that's the Holy Spirit. And he pops up in between and he looks at me and he goes, yeah, you're going to have to land the plane and get out and let the, let the owner fly it. I thought, hmm, okay. So we land the airplane. We get out of the airplane. The other two folks get out with us. And I, I get over and I'm standing on the tarmac and, and the other folks, the, the, the owner and his group, get into the airplane. And as I'm standing there on the tarmac and I'm looking around, I'm thinking, wait a minute. There's no other airplane here. I look out in the parking lot. I don't see a car in the parking lot. I'm thinking, what? Well, how am I getting out of here? What's the plan? 
And at that point, the, the flight instructor sticks his head back out of the airplane. And he looks at me and says, don't worry about it. You're close to home. They shut the door and they take off. I knew when I woke up immediately what that was. And that morning, uh, I actually, I had the sermon that morning. I don't remember what I preached on. It was probably out of, you know, Matthew chapter 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that morning, after the, after the sermon, I, you know, Susan and I talked about this, and Susan had had a very similar thing happen to her that morning as well, and she and I talked to Gary and Karen, and I told Gary about this dream, and I said, Gary, I know exactly what the Holy Spirit is telling me. Uh, Susan and I are going to have to resign from the leadership of the church. And uh, Gary understood. So it gets towards the beginning of December, and we, we told the leadership of the rest of the church, because we were having a leadership team meeting that, that evening, we told them about that uh, later that evening. And so, so the, everybody in the stars in the leadership knew that, hey, Susan and I are going to be resigning from the leadership of the church. So, get to December, and the Holy Spirit says, um, Notice uh, you, know, you haven't really done a whole lot past this point, haven't really sent any kind of uh, resignation letter for the board to, to Gary. Uh, you need to kind of get that done. And so then I officially said, okay, Gary, this is my resignation from the board. Uh, you, you know, the, the December meeting is going to be Susan's and my last, last meeting with, with the board. So I'm kind of taking this very slowly, sort of walking it out. Some people might call it dragging my heels. <laughs> so we get, so December was our last meeting as part of the leadership team and as well, he instituted two new board members uh, in January. This last week, uh, Susan and I were praying and the Holy Spirit in the midst of our prayer time, kind of jerks me up by the, the collar and says, hey, Scott, when are you going to get out of the airplane? And I pretty well knew exactly what that meant. And we, as far as Gary and myself and, and Susan and the rest of the leadership, have kind of been talking around this issue, for lack of a better way to describe it. But the Holy Spirit had made it pretty darn clear. Scott, you're not going to have a plan. But you got to leave. I don't like not having a plan. I don't really like the thought of leaving the sanctuary and not knowing what we're supposed to be doing. But the Holy Spirit's made it pretty darn clear. Scott, you're supposed to leave. I'm not telling you anything more until you do that. So that is where we're at today. I think out of, uh, Susan and I were talking about it earlier here this week. Bill, Denise, Gary, Karen, Susan, and myself are the six who've been here the longest. Denise, a few weeks ago you gave us a word. The wall is built. That was just one more confirmation of one of those things that I really didn't want to <laughs> act on. I guess the only thing as far as that I would say at that point is, beyond this, we, we love you guys, Gary and Karen, you're fantastic. You're some of, you've been some of the best friends that we've had. We love you both. 
our last Sunday is going to be in two weeks. So that kind of is where the, this last piece of the message has been going to. And I haven't, I, I put this at the very end, and now I'm kind of looking at this thinking, okay, uh, how do I kind of wrap this up? But I wrap this up saying that as I was thinking over, Lord, taking the four things, you know, the, what, what, frankly, this is probably the last time that I get a chance as far as to, to get the message at, at this church and, and deliver this to folks. So what do I say? And these were the four things that, that really came to my mind. That I, I would really like to leave with you. Be a powerful church. Expect powerful things to happen. Expect the Holy Spirit to move amongst you. Expect the Holy Spirit to move through you. Individually, you. Not you as congregation, I mean you. Be a church of love. Be a church that loves one another. Be a church that loves your neighbor. Be a, church of, be a church that loves people you disagree with. Be a church full of freedom. Be a person full of freedom. Because the designs that God has for your life are unbelievable. You could not wrap your head around them. Frankly, his box is so big, you ain't got a box. And be a church that hears the voice of God, that knows his voice, that practices hearing his voice.